Thank you, Dr. Donfred, for the invitation and for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon or good morning. It's still good morning, everybody here. And thank you for uh, joining uh, my uh, presentation today. Uh, the background for Afghanistan is the fall of the Republic uh, in Afghanistan on 15th of August 2021, the topple of the regime in Kabul, and then the takeover of Taliban last year. So this is the background that all came together after a so-called peace agreement between the U.S. and the Taliban in Doha, the capital city of Qatar. So this is the background that I wanted to give you before I open my remarks about what is going on in Afghanistan now. So we are celebrating the 33rd anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall at a very critical juncture of our time. The devastating war in Ukraine took place just six months after the US and NATO withdrawal from Afghanistan. And by that, I think we can make a, bit a sense that uh, how quickly we have entered into a new era of competition again between West and the East, or I should say between Russia and the West. Uh, this time the war in Ukraine is very close to the Europe and to the West. It's only at your doorsteps. This war has particularly distracted the attention of the West once again from Afghanistan. And uh, I think that it will have an impact and implications again. It will come back with a price again, maybe for the West and for the Europe in one way or the other, as it came back in, 20, in 1989 when the jihad and the holy war against the Soviet invasion was done. And then the last Russian general who left the country on the bridge crossing Afghanistan into Hayratan of Uzbekistan, he said that we are now done with Afghanistan. Actually, that was the time that even the West, the NATO, the US, and its allies were done with Afghanistan back in 1989. So Afghanistan was forgotten that time. And then my country entered into a bloody civil war for 10 years. And then the emergence of the Taliban, the emergence of several terrorist groups like Al-Qaeda, who engineered the 9-11 tragedy. And then the West was back in Afghanistan and spent 20 years of time, blood, money, resources, and tried to build a nation, trying to build a state. And everything was left all of a sudden, and the Taliban came back. So this is a situation with Afghanistan, as I mentioned in the beginning. Now, Afghanistan is facing its own walls internally after the fall of the republic to the Taliban. Let me briefly touch upon several challenging walls that Afghanistan is going through under the Taliban. Right now, as I'm speaking, an estimated 24 million Afghans are in dire need of only food. Not the ideal food that we talk about. They are in need of just oil and sugar and wheat and uh, something like that. It has been more than 15 months that girls who have been studying at, and from grade six upwards until high school, they have been prevented from going to school. No, there is no school for girls in middle school, no girls allowed to go to middle school and high school. And in most of the cities, girls cannot attend universities because they don't feel secure and in some cases, the Taliban just prevent them directly from going to the colleges, to the high schools. Vulnerable groups of Afghanistan. Afghanistan is a very diverse country. Afghanistan uh, used to inhabit different uh, ethnic groups and from different religious backgrounds. For example, uh, you should be uh, surprised, some of you, that Afghanistan had a Jewish community. Afghanistan has and had Hindu and Sikh community. Currently, only 110 Hindu Sikh uh, members of the community are living in Afghanistan, and they are waiting for their visa and for evacuation. Last month, 60 of them attempted to leave the country, but they were stopped at the airport by the Taliban. 
So they feel somehow in a cage in their own country. They used to live there, they used to raise their kids there, they used to make businesses in Afghanistan, but now only 110 of them have le left in the country and they're waiting for their visa to go to India for evacuation. In the same case, other minority groups, ethnic groups are going under severe persecution in Afghanistan. No political party is actually functioning in the country. All the political parties, political leaders, political groups have been vanished from the country and they're living in exile. And nobody dares to return to the country despite the Taliban's call that come back. You can return to your country, you can leave, but you cannot take part in politics anymore because we didn't want you to be any, yeah, we didn't want to give you that, that chance because you have already lost that chance. Coming back to the girls and minorities, very recently, on the 30th of September, a suicide bomber entered a class like this, a very big class like this, full of girls from the age of 18 to 19 or 20, in the west of Kabul, which is a Hazara populated area. Hazara is one of the ethnic groups of Afghanistan where, where I come from, hail from. And this suicide bomber blew himself up in the middle of this crowded class who were studying pre-university, preparatory university uh, lessons like geometry, physics, and things like that, just to prepare for the university entry exams. More than 53 young students were killed in this class, and most of them were young girls in their late teenage. And this kind of attack has been repeated in the country since 2017. So the Taliban did not take any responsibility and nobody took any responsibility. So the irony was that such attacks took place even before the Taliban returned to power and nobody took responsibility. Sometimes the ISIS took responsibility, the Daesh, the Islamic State of Khurasan that they have named themselves who are operating in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. But this time, nobody took responsibility for the attacks and the community was in shock that who, has, who is behind this kind of attacks? So the people, the vulnerable groups in Afghanistan, they don't feel safe even in their homes. They cannot feel safe in their mosques. They cannot practice their social life that they wanted or that they used to do before the Taliban. This is a big wall for the people. The people fill the wall inside in their homes in Afghanistan. Extrajudicial killings are rampant across the country. If you just read and type in Google that uh, extrajudicial killings by Taliban in the past one year, you will find scores of examples. And Nobody is there to bring the Taliban responsible, to hold them responsible and bring about peace and justice. I touch upon the freedom of speech, where I come from, the media community in Afghanistan. Actually, the media has vanished from the country on a large scale. According to the International Freedom of Federation of Journalists, over 300 media outlets were closed since the Taliban came to power in Afghanistan. Most of these 300 outlets were independent TV, radios, newspapers. They, all of them are gone now. More than 60% of the journalists from Afghanistan have been removed from their jobs, and most of them have uh, made attempt to evacuate the country. And a large number of them are women journalists. So. Nobody can, even now, in Kabul, on the street, nobody can even talk about their past that I was a journalist because it, make, it makes them vulnerable and to persecution by the Taliban. So these are some of the issues that we are going through in Afghanistan uh, after the, the return of Taliban. But this is a connect, I want to make a connection that when the US and NATO withdrew, in a very rushed manner from Afghanistan. Exactly six months after this rushed withdrawal, the Ukraine 
invasion by the Russians take place. Maybe there is no connection or relevance, but for me as an Afghan, it makes a connection, it makes a relevance, it makes sense. Uh, even I read, I think, on an article by the former Swedish uh, president or former prime minister that he also argued in the same manner that why it's happening like that. Is there a connection or not? And he believes that there was a connection that after six months after the withdrawal of the US from Afghanistan, the Russians make a very bold step and they invade Ukraine. So there are connections, of course. Now, let me talk a, bit, a little bit about the Ukraine war impact on my country. I want to just make it a headline here that the US power of engaging into toppling the regimes across the world is very much good. It has a very uh, impressive record of toppling the regimes, removing people from power, but it has a very bad record and staying the course. It has a very bad record and strategic patience when it comes to state building, making peace, democracy, and sustaining that, at least in the case of Afghanistan, in the case of Libya, in the case of Iraq, in many other cases, I think you can find those evidences. The war in Ukraine is really, it's a big shift in the balance of power now between NATO and its leading rivals, the R Russia and China. And Afghanistan's withdrawal is, makes a case here. The defeat of NATO is not a victory for the Taliban only. This is a victory for the Russia, for the China, even for Iran and Pakistan and for other uh, nations who are somehow helping the Taliban. And today they have the normalist and the most, they have the close relations with the Taliban. Russia, China, and Pakistan have allowed Taliban diplomats to take over the embassies, but they have not recognized the Taliban and, right until now, but they have a normal diplomatic relations with the Taliban. And rightly, the Taliban have taken full advantage of this war of Ukraine. They have smartly exploited this vacuum and they have consolidated their power inside the country by all means, which also include those mistreatments that I mentioned earlier with their own people, with the Afghan citizens. As the West attention diverted from Afghanistan towards Ukraine, the Taliban have smartly played the regional cards by maintaining these warm relations with China, with Russia, with Pakistan with uh, other uh, allies. The Russian engagement with the Taliban actually started back in 2017. By the time the Russians had concluded that there will be a withdrawal from Afghanistan by NATO and by US. That's why they started their homework back in 2017. They provided weapons, night vision weapons, which played a very, very important role the, uh, in, the, in the war between, in the fighting between the Taliban and the Afghan security forces. So the main aim was to antagonize the United States and then help the Taliban in case the Taliban won the war. So that, that is now the case. They antagonized the US and then now they are helping the Taliban. And Russia is now willing to engage diplomatically with the Taliban. So I think Russia after Pakistan was the second state that handed over the embassy to the Taliban diplomats. However, the rise of Taliban in Afghanistan is not without cause, even for Russia. The concerns about the drug trafficking and the flow of terrorism and terrorists from Afghanistan into Central Asian territories is a very high concern for the Russians. It has already 
started. The border between Tajikistan and Afghanistan has never been unstable until, as it is now. There are, there are movements happening, sometimes clashes are taking place, and uh, there are already signs of instability in, in, in the Afghan Central Asian borders under the Taliban. Rockets have been fired into Turkmenistan, into Uzbekistan, and to Tajikistan that we border in the north. Now a terrorist group called the Tajikistan Taliban. They are operating and they are based actually across the border. They have activities, they have cross-border activities uh, on, the, on, on that Padakhshan territory of Afghanistan and Tajikistan. And they are free to wander around. The, the Russian guards are across the border, but we are surprised that, okay, why they are not stopped. In the same vein, the Chinese have played also a significant role in making the Taliban win this war. The Chinese also engaged with the Taliban after 2014. They provided also weapons. Chinese weapons were discovered during the, the fightings between Taliban and the Afghan security forces. China has a very great influence over Pakistan. And the Pakistan has been working closely with the Taliban. And China is trying to achieve some of its strategic goals in Afghanistan through Pakistan. Right now, as I'm speaking, there are several Chinese companies who are present in Afghanistan and they are extracting minerals illegally. The last case was there is a province called Tahar province in the north of Afghanistan, and the Chinese mine extractors are working there day and night. And, and, our, and, and we got a news, actually we got this news first broken, our sources told us, and then we investigated which came true. So the Taliban are allowing the Chinese companies to invest, to extract minerals, which Afghanistan is a very rich country in terms of mineral wealth. And geopolitically, the Chinese are paying Taliban to protect its tiny border with Afghanistan. The Xinjiang, the Uyghurs, who are dissidents, who are uh, making troubles for the Chinese from time to time, they are actually living in Afghanistan. Some of them, some parts of them are uh, scattered across this border, and the Taliban are given funds by the Chinese to protect them. The Taliban uh, are equipped by the Chinese to fight against them, but the Taliban are not fighting them. The Taliban are giving them refuge, and at the same time the Taliban are using these funds and equipments, uh, and, uh, but the Chinese are still happy with the Taliban because uh, for them, uh, it's important that there is no more the presence of the NATO and U.S. and Afghanistan as a bigger rival. So I'm wrapping up very quickly about the power of stay of the United States and NATO in Afghanistan that we have a shared history of making shared and common efforts in the West with the West to make the Berlin Wall fall back in 1989. Afghanistan's anti-Soviet jihad, so-called jihad I call it, but it was not the jihad, it was just a, a war that we fought on behalf of the West in Afghanistan. This made the Russians to de get defeated in the Berlin Wall fall in 1989. The Afghan war against the Soviet invasion was instrumental but let's keep in our mind that today's world has transformed drastically from that time. Afghanistan's instability can affect the West's interest in one way or the other in the future again, and it should not be neglected. This needs due attention and a political determination on this side of the world, not to forget Afghanistan. And Afghanistan should not be forgotten as the, war in, as the war in Ukraine goes on. That is another war. Afghanistan's war is still on, and 
we should not forget it. Thank you very much. For this. So hello, my name is Irene Garcia Garcia from Spain. Thank you for your short presentation. And since we are in the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, I wanted to ask, do you think it's possible to use cultural diplomacy in Afghanistan in the current context or in the future with the Taliban, of course? OK. Uh, it's very unfortunate that the Taliban are now fighting our cultural values in Afghanistan. Back in 2001, they destroyed the bigger giant Buddha statues based in Bamiyan province. They blown up the entire 53 meter statues, which was one of the famous ones. And then they started to eradicate one of the languages of Afghanistan, which is Farsi Dari, which has a history, uh, more than a thousand years history, more than even before that, I think, uh, Nasim is more, uh, yeah, we speak the same language, fortunately. The Taliban are now pursuing the same direction and policy against uh, the ancient cultures of my country. They have closed all these uh, cafes, they have closed all the uh, libraries that the youth and students frequented there. Uh, the TV, all of all the TV channels that they were airing, uh, entertainment, uh, dramas, music, all of them are banned. So there is no venue of engagement with the Taliban on cultural diplomacy. Yeah, very clean and cat, I should say this, and you can find it out. Um, hi again. Um, I just wanted to make uh, a comment about your speech. Thank you. I think it was uh, a great speech. And uh, I think it's also really important to raise awareness uh, for what is happening in Afghanistan. And uh, I have read a little bit about the history of Afghanistan for the past 50 years, especially with what happened in the late 60s, early 70s with the Soviet Union invasion and then followed afterwards uh, from the US. And I feel like it's really unfortunate that Afghanistan was more or less like a battlefield for both of these superpowers to prove which one can dominate um, the other. And then the rise of Taliban, of course, this extremist group in, in Taliban has been affecting uh, this country for such a long time and it's still an ongoing issue. And um, from it's to me, when, when you were sharing these uh, stories, listening to, to these stories from someone uh, that is, is from Afghanistan uh, and, and kind of merging it with what I um, read, it really makes it so so real and and uh, unfortunate, of course, because you mentioned that girls cannot even go to university, and you were talking about Kabul, but also in other regions of, of uh, in Afghanistan, uh, girls cannot even go to elementary school, and they sometimes have to disguise themselves as boys to kind of uh, go out in the street without wearing a burqa, and it's uh, extremely horrible I, I cannot even imagine and thank you for bringing this up because I feel that we live in a world that is uh, unjust and doesn't give importance and uh, to lives of people equally so I think that uh, we should be more aware of what is happening in the world so thank you for bringing this up thank you I appreciate that and also appreciate that you're studying about Afghanistan's history it's very important that because Afghanistan is one of the cases that I think uh, every social sciences students should go through uh, because of its tumultuous situation as well as the magnitude of the players in Afghanistan. Once upon a time it was the forefront of the Cold War rivalry. So, 
So this is not something small. So that's why maybe Afghanistan is not a prosperous, successful country or stable, but it is a very, very unique case that to be studied and to be uh, pondered on. Thank you. Uh, greetings. My, my name is Jack. I'm from Zambia. Um, I have a concern. I think uh, your story, the story, the presentation about Afghanistan is quite emotional. And of course, we've seen how life has been had both on TV and uh, in, the, in the print media. In this. We've, be, we've been up updated with that, and it's quite sad. Uh, my, my question would be, First, before my question, I also want to, to, to perhaps throw my mind to say, I think China, to me, I see China to be playing uh, games of op op optimism. You see? They are, they, when, they f when they see where war is, I'm, I'm sure they could have played a, 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 a bigger role to, to quench the, the conflicts and stuff, but all they look at is business, like you, you put it where they are mining, illegal minings. And um, of course, you talked of the connection between the, the conflicts in Afghanistan and, uh, excuse me, and in Ukraine. I know the people there, or the, the countries or the nations that are fully involved is Russia and America, of course. It's, it's, it's open. But my question is, is there any hope for Afghanistan to get back to normalcy? Is there hope? And where does hope lie? What should we be looking at? What, where should we be running to in order to, to, to resolve the, co the, the, the conflicts? And what, do we, what are our plans? Rather than just crying about what is happening, mm -hmm. I think we need to begin to talk about the way forward. Thank you. Thank you for your question and comment. Of course, um, uh, I had uh, an emotional tone because still I haven't recovered from the, from the trauma of uh, losing a 20-year achievement that we made in Afghanistan. And it has a very vibrant media which was well known in the region. Across Afghanistan's region, uh, there we could not trace an independent media like a, uh, the one that we had in Afghanistan. It was a kind of world-class journalism in some cases. Uh, regardless of all those losses that we made, actually we are back in the first point that we were there in 1989 when the war, the Soviet war in Afghanistan was done. They withdrew and then my country entered into another uh, cycle of conflict. We are just entering into another cycle of conflict which is inevitable actually, unfortunately. The civil war probably will be returning maybe in now in different shape, in different way. But looking forward, the agreement between Taliban and the United States, which is called the Doha Agreement, has one provision which has not been implemented yet. And that's why the US government is trying to take that now seriously with the Taliban. And that provision of that agreement says that when the Taliban return to peace and engage with the Afghan government, uh, then it should also engage to enter into a political process with the rest of political actors inside the country. Uh, so there is, an, uh, there is a provision in the Doha Peace Agreement that an interim inclusive government should be formed in Afghanistan within the Taliban. M maybe the Taliban will be the majority, the upper hand in that government, but that interim government must, be, must have the components of all political groups. And currently, the U.S. Special Envoy for Afghanistan, who is Mr. Tom West, he is engaging now with the Taliban. Uh, and my last, latest information is that they are talking about this particular point with the Taliban. And they are giving warnings to the Taliban that uh, this cannot sustain this way that you just negate all and then continue this. This will not happen. 
So still the U.S. has le leverages and the West has leverages. Every week, $40 million are pumped into the Afghanistan National Bank because to maintain the economy and currency. And all this money goes from the United States. The U.S. has been the largest funder to the Afghanistan since the fall of Taliban. And the Taliban understand that. So there is a small ray of hope that we uh, continue things from the Doha agreement and the Taliban try to engage. Everybody's trying to press the Taliban to re-engage. So there are several processes going on. The biggest process is the Istanbul process where most of the former Afghan politicians are now living there. There's another process we just started in Oslo, Norway last year where the Taliban came there and they discussed with the Afghan rest of Afghan stakeholders. So, and uh, we'll see, then there is the Doha agreement and the Doha process actually, that, that the Americans are trying to go back and sit in Doha and talk with the Taliban and bring everybody around them. So there are some hopes, but it's not easy because the Taliban have committed a lot of atrocities since last year until now. They have committed a lot of crimes and last week the ICC criminal court just uh, made their final decision to resume their uh, study of the crimes of the Taliban, and which is a very good news. The ICC resumes its uh, operation on Afghanistan, and this is a very bad news for the Taliban, and uh, I think it will be also be under leverage on the, over the Taliban. So a whole concerted effort is required from, from every side. Uh, including the regional engagements with Russia and China is very important because without them you cannot bring stability in Afghanistan. And stability in the country is in their favor as currently. So as a, uh, as a wise player, I think they will also be happy to have to see a stable Afghanistan. But under the Taliban, Afghanistan will not enjoy stability for sure. Uh, thank you so much for your insight and for your knowledge. It's really appreciated to have, like, um, kind of like just to witness and to hear. Um, just to echo of my um, the first question that was asked, um, what do you think the diaspora, uh, so it's outside of, Af so like the Afghanis, like around the world, basically, um, what has been done or what can be uh, done in the future to preserve the culture that is being erased mm. at like the in the homeland so if there is no if the roots are being basically ripped mm. apart then how can the rest of the p afghani population around the world the diaspora kind of like maintain the dialogue and um, preserve the culture moving forward and what effect will this have on the new uh, generations in afghanistan who will are completely cut off from the rest of the world so they don't really have exchanges with uh, with the rest of the world because of the like you said the uh, they don't have transmission of channels from around the world or they mm. kind of like removed uh, places like libraries and and cafes so they're really like cut off so how can they be how, how can the story of their ancestors be told to them moving forward this is very a great a uh, question actually, and this is also one of the our generational dilemma now. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, a huge uh, number of the Afghan artists uh, uh, um, uh, media community and filmmakers, uh, those who are involved in all cultural activities in Afghanistan, most of them have been evacuated from Afghanistan. And uh, in the past one year, they have been able to hold different types of events and occasions uh, in Berlin and Paris and United States and Canada, wherever they have. The bulk of them are living in Paris. If you want to uh, chase any of them, and they are, they are yeah, filmmakers are there, in the and some of them have been stationed in Italy uh, in Germany. So. They had their own entities and companies, so they have evacuated those companies. It's good. And some of them have been able to register their companies and their organizations in exile. And in the case of media, where I live in Washington, D.C., 
three media outlets have registered and they have and they are receiving fundings from the United States different entities and they are functioning in Washington DC and they are producing very good content and they also reach out to Afghanistan through any t- mean that they have uh, fortunately Taliban have not cut off internet uh, still you can touch base with your people family via any internet and uh, uh, means uh, teleca- means so there is the connection there is the will and determination to continue to revive the culture uh, inside the country and outside the country for diaspora uh, last year's evacuation had uh, it was the biggest evacuation in the history only in the US nearly 150,000 people were evacuated all of them elites from different sectors of life and the same went to other countries so that linkage is there now the diaspora living abroad previously now they are they receive the connection that the new generation just moved there uh, and they are working together for example, two weeks back, when the Hazara killing, this incident of this class that I told you. So today is the 14th day of that. Today is another Twitter storm. Last Twitter storm was 10 million, trending 10 million. So one of the events that the country had not seen before. So these things are continuing, and that is uh, that makes us hopeful that we can still live abroad in exile, but we can keep our culture alive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Arif. Uh, I sorry I missed your first part of the lecture. Uh, maybe you have touched upon it. Uh, uh, my uh, question is that after the withdrawal uh, of uh, U.S. forces from Afghanistan, uh, what do you think? What really America wants from Afghanistan now? Is there anything? Uh, what is the status of the uh, engagement with the uh, Taliban government now uh, and uh, you know Pakistan has been facilitating uh, the, the uh, negotiations between uh, America and Taliban and also doing a lot. Um, what uh, Pakistan can do for the betterment of the Afghanistan? Is there anything going on uh, like rebuilding efforts or the uh, socially social and economic uplift in Afghanistan. Thank you, Ashmi uh, In Washington, D.C., uh, the Rand Corporation uh, issued a research and uh, a kind of policy recommendation to the U.S. government a few months back, and they put out uh, three directions and three options to the U.S. government how to uh, act vis-a-vis uh, Taliban. The first one was to fight the Taliban, to press them, and replace them again with uh, something else. The second option was to engage with the Taliban and to bring about uh, a peace dialogue type of settlement based on the Doha Agreement that I earlier mentioned, that there was one provision of the Doha Agreement which clearly says that an interim inclusive government must be established within, with the Taliban's partnership uh, in that. And there was another option by the U.S. to disengage, but not fight the Taliban, disengage with them, uh, put more sanctions on them, uh, on the country, on, on their uh, leadership. But currently, the U.S. has concluded that disengaging with the Taliban will harm the Afghan vulnerable communities because the population is facing a huge hunger in the coming winter, actually. 24 million people are waiting for basic food uh, supplies. Now, the U.S. is pumping money, and the funds that were freezed, the Afghanistan $4 billion funds, which were freezed by the U.S. banks, now those funds have, are going to be released for the population, and they will be spent under the supervision of uh, several entities in order to make sure that these funds are not in the hands of Taliban. So the U.S. government has appointed a new uh, special envoy for Afghanistan, whose name is Tom West, and he has worked in Afghanistan previously, so he's engaging with the Taliban he, several, uh, he made several attempts to bring the Taliban and 
the opposition leaders together uh, and continue discussions. And uh, also, the U.S. intelligence is involved. Uh, DPT uh, CIA director met with the Taliban intelligence chief in Qatar two weeks ago. It means that, that the U.S. is trying to hold control on Afghanistan's territory still. You remember that the Al-Qaeda leader was killed in Kabul by a drone attack in late July. Al-Iman al-Zawahiri, the top Al-Qaeda leader, he was killed in Kabul under the Taliban. So, and Pakistan is also facilitating all these efforts, including the drone attacks that they are taking place inside Afghanistan. Most of these drone attacks are being facilitated by the Pakistani territory in one way or the other. So the U.S. is present in Afghanistan uh, in that manner now. They don't have troops there, but they are supervising. They have the strategy of over-the-horizon operation. It means that they can see things on the ground for, for over the horizon, what is going on. However, in the coming uh, spring, which is terribly going to be another uh, cycle of uh, war, because different opposition groups are preparing for resistance against the Taliban, if these political efforts didn't uh, yield any result until the spring, then there will be a vicious cycle of war inside Afghanistan. And the Taliban also are afraid of that because the Taliban cannot sustain with this situation. The economy is bad. The population are unpleased with what's going on in the country. And also the Taliban are suffering from lack of international legitimacy. No country in the world has recognized them until now. So. There are things still under control uh, in terms of the U.S. engagement with the Taliban, I should say, from their perspective. Hello, I have a question. My name is Priscilla from Kenya. And I just wanted to ask um, what can be done to give the voice to the Afghan women. Uh, you mentioned uh, since the um, Taliban regime that most of the media stations were closed and the most uh, people that were affected are the women. Uh, what can be done and also the young uh, people uh, you mentioned the girls they cannot uh, go to school to study what but what can be done about this situation uh, yeah thank you thank you for your question uh, right now uh, inside afghanistan it's difficult uh, to work for women uh, last week uh, a group of women just students they had uh, they wanted to hold a, a press conference inside an, a hotel and to tell uh, the world that we are forming an educational uh, community or society inside Kabul. When their uh, press conference was over, the hotel was uh, attacked by the Taliban and all of these women were arrested by the Taliban and they were taken into detention, including some other uh, male students. And all of them are now under in jail. I should say they are in detention. Nobody knows where they are. But in the same vein, uh, some women tried to protest on the road against the opening of the schools. Uh, they were beaten by the Taliban. Uh, they were insulted by the Taliban. So it is very difficult to work for the women inside the country. There is no chance. There is no space. Outside the country, yes, uh, several efforts are going on in many countries, parts of the world, including the United States. The U.S. government has appointed a special envoy for women on Afghanistan. Her name is Rina Amiri. She is an Afghan-American lady. And, the, and she has a fund, a big uh, fund for them and the spending. As, at the same time, uh, w Afghan women are uh, having their own uh, network. The Afghanistan Women Network, which was based in Afghanistan, now it's operating uh, outside the country. They have members. They are engaging with different uh, groups, uh, including the United Nations. So these are some of the things that are happening. I mean, the Afghan women NGOs are functioning abroad, and but inside the country, there is no space, actually, to go there and work together with the women there because the Taliban will not allow it, and uh, they will crush them. Simply, I think this is the story that I want to tell you. I don't want to make it cosmetic. They will crush them. I mean, they will beat them. They will detain them. And this is happening right now. <coughs> uh, 
Hi. Um, oh, yeah, it's working. Um, I'm Lauren. I'm from the UK. I just wanted to ask a question. It kind of leads on from what other people have discussed, but it's just on the matter of recognition. I know you touched on it a couple of times during your presentation, which is really interesting, but I just wondered what your opinion on was on other, not just the US, but other um, countries across the globe engaging with the Taliban um, by recognizing them politically. Do you think that's the only way to kind of further the advancement of human rights in the country by the recognition of them and engaging diplomatically with them? Or do you feel that there's a different way that that could be achieved? Yeah, I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your question. Uh, actually, engaging with the Taliban is, uh, is not an option or a choice for the international community because Taliban are controlling Afghanistan so in order to reach out to the rest of the population, so you need to engage with them, number one. Number two, not recognizing the Taliban is an option because uh, this is the only leverage that diplomatically you have against the Taliban. You don't recognize them. You don't uh, allow them to <coughs> be a normal partner with you. So this is the, the main, uh, or the, I should say, the biggest leverage that uh, the states have against the Taliban right now, not to recognize them. First, put conditions of them, open the girls' school, allow people to uh, ex exercise their social freedom, uh, which is not likely bad, uh, and also try to form an inclusive government in Afghanistan, accept all people from all ethnic groups and political groups. Uh, but this, but this, how long will continue this? In the long run, I think it's not uh, sustainable uh, not to engage with the Taliban and also not to recognize them. So the international community should take a firmer stance on the Taliban. Uh, because as we continue moving on, the Taliban will consolidate their power. And then the Chinese and the Russians will also consolidate their grounds with the Taliban. And they will find a way how to survive. They have survived the last one year uh, and uh, if they find more means and ways they can survive for longer and that is really a threat if the taliban survive longer and they continue this kind of policies that they are now pursuing that is definitely a threat for uh, for the world yes, yes. I'm very much uh, feeling uh, happy that I, it gets traction, the Afghanistan issue. Hi, um, so yeah, we talked earlier. <laughs> um, building on the last question about um, recognition, I was wondering um, if you could uh, give us some insights, your, at least maybe your own opinion about what role can the UN do in terms of addressing the Afghanistan issue. We know for a fact that um, Russia and China are members of the Security Council and they have the veto power. So definitely in that part of the UN um, mechanism, there will be tensions. But um, in the rest, uh, the UN is supposed to represent um, the whole of the international community and we have the UN flag behind you. Um, I was wondering how can the UN work as uh, an organization, an international organization or as a platform for uh, ad in terms of addressing the um, not just the Taliban issue but the Afghanistan issue as a whole as a, as a state itself thank you thank you for your question about the UN's role uh, in Afghanistan uh, the UN has played uh, its peacemaking or peace building role back in 1989 91 92 uh, between the then communist regime and the Mujahideen who were fighting the Taliban. And then that uh, round, different rounds of talks took place uh, by the UN intervention in Geneva and several other locations, including Pakistan, Iran. But none of them were helpful. So in Afghanistan, UN has a very poor record of um, uh, making peace or building peace or facilitating peace talks this is uh, this is not good but un must be given that role because it's the role that they should play not other actors actually because independent actors like uh, the united states or the chinese or the russians they have their own interests so they will lobby on their own 
It's the UN which is the legitimate body to play that role, but the UN has been sidelined in Afghanistan for so many years, and still this is the case. Now, you know, UN has a big mission in Afghanistan, which is called the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA. Uh, it has a special envoy. The UN has also a special human rights rapporteur. His name is Richard Bennett from New Zealand. So this guy is the only hope for Afghanistan's uh, vulnerable communities there, the special UN reporter on human rights. He's frequently visiting the country and he comes back with a lot of horrible stories and then he tries to work it with the rest of the actors. Uh, we still believe uh, there is a hope for the UN uh, to play a constructive role in Afghanistan under the Taliban because this is the only international organization which is present now in Kabul. They have an office in Kabul and they have four offices across Afghanistan, regional offices, and they are reaching out to the people. So I think, I believe personally that UN should be given the role, but this is not the case actually. UN has been sidelined. Uh, intentionally in most of the yeah critical discussions uh, in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you for your patience on Afghanistan. Appreciate it.